the uh, fireside in this case is kind of virtual. You have to sort of imagine it, but we're, we're trying to get in the spirit of that. So we're talking about Nato. They have a very important announcement that they're making today. And uh, I'm going to let Stefan and Jennifer start off by telling you what's new with their AI-enabled software to make us all safer. So we're an AI technology company that works with commercial vehicle fleets, passenger transport, goods delivery, service fleets. Today we're announcing the launch of the second generation of our driver behavior learning platform, uh, which is meant to take the benefits of autonomous driving that we all dream of 10, 15 years from now and bring them forward to today. We retrofit a small uh, sensor device to any commercial vehicle that's able to augment what the human driver can do by watching both the road, warning them about potential hazards, and by watching the driver to make sure they're paying attention and they've actually seen whatever the risks may be, and alerting the driver, giving feedback and warnings whenever the risk becomes too high. Through that, we're able to bring half of the benefit of autonomy here today and reduce collisions and losses by over 50%. Jennifer, you came from the autonomous world. You worked at Waymo. Yes. And um, as Stefan is saying, Elon Musk has been talking a lot about how the autonomous car is going to like take safety out of the equation. But we can actually, we can actually start to do that now. And that's sort of what brought you into Nato, from what I hear. That's right. You know, I really believe that fully self-driving will happen eventually, um, and that there do, will do be. Do you have a prediction of how long it'll be? If you're talking about ubiquitous, then yeah. well over a decade, maybe even two. Right? Yeah. We're seeing now only one company doing a, a small um, geographic, geo-fenced area where they're doing fully self-driving. Very limited. So it's it's quite a hard problem. But what I think is really great about Nauto is you can use sa those same advances in big data, machine learning, um, computer vision, and help people today. And it's really about using AI to enhance people, not just replace them. And as Stefan said, we're seeing those results now. Why should we wait a decade or two for full autonomy to see these safety benefits? We're talking about building a better person instead of a better car, I guess you could say. Now, the, uh, from what I understand from you, you folks, is the number one issue is distraction in the car. And this is true with the commercial fleets that you work with and also with average drivers. So we have many distractions, the phone, texting. Um, how do you tell people, how do you detect that somebody's distracted and how do you inform them of that, in your case, the commercial drivers. So distraction is the number one cause of collisions by far. Uh, over 70% of all collisions are because of distraction. Um, it's underreported in nearly all the government statistics. The U.S. federal government will tell you it's about 15% of collisions. We see it's much higher than that. The commercial drivers that we work with on average are actually better than consumer drivers because they have more years they of drive driving the experience. They, they have, it's their job. So we're already seeing a population that's better than average. But even within that, uh, we see that 70% of the collisions are caused by a distraction. Um, the way we detect distraction is we're watching the driver's body pose, their eyes, their head pose, if they're holding something in their hand, if they have an object up to their ear. And all of you have the number one cause for distraction in your pocket. <laughs> Uh, and that's why we're seeing actually fatalities. Hey, you're, you're just assuming they all have them and they're, they're probably looking at them right now. <laughs> that, right there. Yeah, it right may there. not be in your pocket. It may be out and you may be distracted. They're that's distracted right. from our actual panel. That's right. Um, and so, not surprisingly, distraction is the number one cause of collisions. What's the number one cause of distractions? Your phone. That's why you're seeing the fatality rate and the collision rate actually rise in the last half decade because it's getting worse and worse. We're addicted to these devices. So we detect when you're holding one, holding up to your ear, staring at it, anytime your eyes are off the road because you may be adjusting the radio or dealing with a child or dealing with a passenger if it's a commercial vehicle. All of those are serious risks. We have, we have distraction events where at, at 130 kilometers an hour, people are distracted for 10, 15, even 20 seconds. If you think about how far you've gone in that span and how many things you might have hit, um, it's, it's very scary. We have fleets. We work mostly with very large commercial fleets, thousands of vehicles. They collectively cover the distance several times around planet Earth fully distracted before our system goes in there to actually change that behavior. And we can reduce distraction by typically about 50 to 80% from whatever the starting point is for that fleet. 
we were talking backstage about how cars today have a lot of devices that are designed to prevent you from changing lanes, that let you see in a blind spot uh, to cause emergency braking. But people are distracted by the distraction device. And I think you said that 50% of them are turned off. Yes. How do you, how do you, uh, I, I don't think the automakers should allow them to be turned off. And I don't know if that's because the consumers demand it or what. But if that's the case, it's not actually very effective, is it? No. When you're building technology into a car, whether it's aftermarket like our system or embedded, you really need to encompass human behavior, right? Our whole goal with our driver learning behavior platform is to permanently change the way a driver is driving. And so we do a lot of studies on how humans behave. And if you design a technology and all you're thinking about is the technology and, you know, thinking like a robot, you're not encompassing people. And so what you see with the example you gave, these lane departure warning systems, is, for example, they expect you to, drivers to always use their blinker. Well, how many of you always use your blinker when you're gonna change lanes? If there's no one driving around you, why would you use your blinker? You're just gonna look to make sure there's no one around you and change lanes. So you start finding sets these off the, warnings uh, annoying, the yeah. exactly. Whereas we really think about what is the person actually trying to do? What is their intent? What is their holistic behavior and what's on the road? And then our distraction alert, for example, is based on tiers. So when we first notice a distraction, we have a small audio alert. We call that a behavioral nudge. We're essentially giving you a really tiny reminder, hey, you should be focusing on driving. If you continue to be distracted or you're distracted multiple times in a row, then we use a voice alert. That's more like coaching. So we're actively coaching the driver. Hey, you're distracted. Then if you manage to ignore all of that, which we see most drivers don't ignore all of those, but you're really distracted at the high speed, really long length, then we have what sounds more like an alarm, because now it's an urgent situation and you may be putting yourself and others in danger. So you don't just randomly put out an alert for no reason. You've really got to think about how are you changing human behavior Part of that time. is based on where the eyes, are you, are you using video for this? That to tell what the person's, to try to gauge the intent? It's computer vision. Uh, so we look at who's in the driver's seat, and we look at what's in their hands, where are their eyes looking, what's their head pose. So we can tell if you've nodded off or you've fallen asleep like this, all of those are readable from your body posture. As well as your holding objects. If you've got a hamburger in your hand and you're eating, that's another form of distraction. So all of that is detected through computer vision. I understand that eye blinks can be used to detect how drowsy you are. Eye blinks is, is one metric, but by the time you start blinking a lot, it's pretty late. Um, so that's more a lagging indicator. Uh, we look at your, your responsiveness to different inputs, which uh, decays much earlier as well. So if you see a pedestrian cross the road and you don't immediately respond to that, either steering or, or braking, that's a much more um, early warning indicator. The fleets that are you using your technology, I understand some of them, I think, report on average 35% reduction in incidents or like accidents, that's probably a pretty good incentive for them to want to keep using it. Yes, so we see, as I mentioned, we see a huge reduction in distraction, 50 to 80% right up front. Distraction is only the main cause, it's not the only cause of collisions. So we look at how, whether you're tailgating, whether you're speeding, other risk factors as well. That results in that 35% reduction, that's on average we're seeing actually bigger reductions in some fleets, particularly the fleets that start off really poor. We can see 50, 60, 70% reduction in the losses. So payback for our system happens in, in somewhere around five, six months. Uh, it's a very rapid return. It's not like an autonomous vehicle where you have to spend 200 or $300,000, right? You get, you get very rapid return on your investment. So Jennifer, it, it's probably fair to say that you're not worried that autonomous cars are going to put your company out of business. <laughs> I'm definitely not worried about that. And I don't think fleets in particular, they don't tend to use vehicles that are the highest end, right? And auto manufacturers tend to put in the fancy tech, including safety tech in their high end vehicles first. So when you're talking about commercial fleet drivers, don't they also deserve the best technology that's going to keep them safe? We think so. But of course, I've also heard that trucks will be the first vehicles to be autonomous. Do you think that's true? 
I think the, the long haul highway driving scenario is one of the easier ones to fully automate. Right. So those uh, long haul trips on, on autobahns or interstates in the US um, are likely to be one of the early adoption scenarios. The, the robo taxi scenario in a crowded urban environment that everyone is gunning for right now is actually one of the harder problems uh, to solve. It's funny because uh, I've been hearing all day that robo ta taxis are imminent, but I don't know. It, it's hard to imagine because particularly in crowded environments, cities like New York or, uh, or uh, Berlin or, or Lisbon, I, I can't imagine uh, I, I, in the next couple of years, any sort of taxi being able to deal with the incredible traffic inputs and pedestrians. And we'll, we'll see them first in, in relatively uh, restricted self-contained environments, college campuses, corporate campuses, uh, you know, there's some retirement communities in the US where there's trials right now for robo taxis. Um, in, in Europe, some of the pedestrian zone areas where there's no other vehicles, speeds are very low anyway and restricted. Those are the kind of places where you will see robo taxis first. Uh, the good news about our technology is because we, we don't replace the driver, we're just augmenting the driver, we're not restricted by geography, by weather conditions, because it's a dual system. We're really adding to the sensing capabilities of, of the human. And we do see in our fleets, because they're commercial drivers and they're better than average, about 15% of our drivers are basically perfect. They will never cause a collision. So for those drivers, the only value we provide is we exonerate them through all the video and telemetry proof when they get hit by somebody else. Uh, and that's also very valuable for a commercial. Uh, I know, Stefan, you were a professor at Stanford and you looked at uh, human behavior. And are, are we very prone to distraction? Or is it uh, sort of inherent in the human animal? We are. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're very social animals. We like keeping things exciting and interactive. And, uh -huh. and driving, particularly for long periods of time, is pretty boring. Uh, so our attention starts to drift. You know, in the old days, as, as you said when we were talking before, it was probably the radio or thinking about a conversation we had. Yeah. Nowadays, we have this perfect distraction device that they have hundreds of engineers trying to figure out how to make it more attractive, more entertaining. <laughs> true. Uh, and so in we're, fact, true. a lot of safety experts compare distracted driving to drunk driving because the behavior pattern is very similar, right? In drunk driving, oftentimes people do it because they don't get caught. And, and it really isn't until something very serious happens that you realize this is a bad thing. The same thing happens with distraction. Most people, I think all of us can agree that we've driven distracted at some point. And, and we there's get away been with nothing it. bad that happened. <laughs> and so you just keep doing it and you sort of test the boundaries more and more. And so behaviorally, it's very similar. So every, every American state and a lot of countries around the world, including in Europe, have laws against distracted driving, but it's hard to see them being in, enforced. Well, not only that, the laws, you know, from our point of view, aren't always, um, they don't help change behavior. So for example, in California, where we're based, it's illegal to be on your phone when you're stopped, like at a red light. In our system, if we detect the phone when the driver's at a red light, we're not going to alert you because the safety risk is probably pretty low and we don't want to annoy the driver right, mm -hmm. per our, our prior conversation. So again, it's really thinking through how are you gonna get sustained behavior change and benefit, not, for us, it's not about a black and white law. The law is very weird because it allows you to look at a map on your phone, but it right. doesn't allow was, you to text on your phone. I was wondering about that, actually, because you have to look at your phone if you're using it as a GPS device, yeah. right? So that's a, that's a, but how could, a law enforcement officer tell what you were doing on your phone if you're just looking at it. Yeah. Moreover, <laughs> it's not any less distracted to be reading a map than it is to be texting. So we see the same behavior detriment either way. And the, the key reason why distraction is not as easily enforceable is that most of it is invisible except to the drivers that are immediately around you that see you starting to swerve and drift like a drunk driver, right? And we actually see in our system we see 11 near miss events where you almost had a serious crash. And what's fascinating about that is in most of those cases, the driver in the vehicle that caused the incident was distracted. Not surprising given that's the number one cause of crashes. But the reason it turned into near miss is because the other driver was not distracted and took some evasive action right. to make sure that you didn't hit them. <laughs> so we're relying, when we're distracted, the reason we get away with it so much and, it's, and we think we're really good when in fact it's the other drivers that are good at making up for our mistakes. So if I was a commercial driver and I had Nauto software on my car, is it teaching me to be a better driver? Is it fair to say that? Yes. So th then if you were driving 
your own car later, uh, you probably drive that better. We, we see in about seven weeks, we see that 60, 70, 80% reduction in the, in the risk behavior. And interestingly, that carries over not only to your personal driving, even when you're driving on, on private time. We, see a, we have some fleets where people bring their own vehicle to their commercial service. Ride sharing is a great example. And we can see the benefits carrying over from their commercial driving time to their personal yeah. driving time. We also see the benefit actually start to spread in the fleet. So we have some fleets where Nato is only in a portion of the vehicles, typically their highest risk vehicles. But because the drivers talk to each other, sometimes the drivers shift vehicles, you can see that benefit shift even into vehicles where there is no Nato device installed. Jennifer, I wanted to ask you this. We only have a couple of minutes left. Um, you see, you came from the world of autonomous cars with Waymo. And I've seen studies that indicate, right now we're able to do autonomy in a sort of geofenced area on the highway. But I've understood that the biggest problem is getting people to take back control of the car after the uh, automatic, automated driving experience. And that's a form of distraction too, because you're actually allowed to be distracted while you're in, in a uh, autonomous situation. So that, that's the hard part, refocusing, right? Right, there are some companies that are only working on what you might call fully self-driving, right? Where there is no handover right. exactly for that reason. No steering but, wheel, no pedals. Exactly, yeah. but there's plenty of technologies that are meant to just sort of get you part of the way where it's driving itself only under these certain circumstances and they expect to then hand it back over. Well, there are plenty of studies that show, one, how long it takes to get the situational awareness to be able to take over control. And if you think about the system is gonna hand back control when it's having its own problem, right? It's probably already in a bad situation. That's not a great time to wake up from your nap or stop reading the newspaper and say, oh, now I'm gonna start driving. Um, so even in those systems, you could actually see where Nato's technology could play a role, right? Because you wanna know what is the driver doing even when they're not driving? Are they paying enough attention that the system could hand back control? You know, I don't like this idea of handing back control, but if you're gonna do it, you at least wanna know what the driver's doing. I can, yeah. <laughs> I can see why with autonomy, you really, it's really in some ways easier to do full autonomy than it is to do this sort of yes. partial autonomy that we're talking about. And uh, well, we're in a brave new world with all this stuff and I'm glad you're making it safer for drivers now and not waiting until autonomous cars are fully on the road. Thank you. We're out of time, thank you. Thank you.